I invested my entire life, my family, my career, my house, my future. That's what I invested into crypto. And over time, as I started bringing revenue through the channel, then yes, that, that is where a lot of the gains came in when I was doing videos where someone would pay me maybe $2,000 in Ethereum when the price of Ethereum was $150. You can do that math now and see that holding that over the long term is, is what brought out, brought out my wealth. And that's something I always try to tell people. If you want to get more involved in crypto, get more involved. There's way more upside to doing that than to just you know throwing money at it and then walking away and not getting invested and, and, and not learning. All right, welcome guys. This is Peter Vuk, founder of Prestigious Game Changers Academy, and thank you for tuning in to our monthly millionaire video series, where we interview the world's most elite and successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, experts, true game changers, people that I personally have massive respect for, and those making a huge difference, not just in their industries, but really in the world. And I've been excited for today's call for a while now. He runs one of the most well-known uh, YouTube channels in the crypto world and on the planet. He created BitBoy Crypto, the brand, also creator of the BitLab Academy. One of the most consistent producers and creators on the face of the earth. Sometimes I'm looking at your videos. I want to catch up on your videos and I'm like, all right, what did he do today? What the, this is today, today, <laughs> today, today, yesterday, and there's six more. So I love the consistency, but appreciate you, man. Thank you for educating the world and for what you do. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Excited. Like I said, you know, getting excited to be on and talk crypto. Uh, you know, I, I think consistency is key. You know, I definitely remember there were times in my kind of journey doing online business uh, where, you know, you just, it's hard to see the payoff at the end of the day for being consistent. Uh, but that's definitely hard work and consistency. It works across any industry, any niche out there. 100%, man. So let's talk about what's been weighing heavy on your mind. Is there anything? the last couple of weeks that's kind of you're laying in bed thinking about or you're really like focused on like educating on i know it's the government there's so many things happening what's been yeah. kind of weighing the most on your mind the past couple of weeks that you could share yeah i think the government is always going to be in the background you know where we don't have a, a true world of crypto regulation i think eventually we're going to have to have a commission similar to the SEC that's only for digital uh, current uh, currency and assets. I, I think we'll see that. So I, I think that's just a, a matter of time. I don't. I talked about this on my channel yesterday during our, our morning live stream. I don't focus that much on you know what the government is and is not going to do in crypto. A lot of people that get all bent out of shape about a couple percentage points increase in tax. Like I'm definitely, you know, I think our tax system is broken for sure. But my biggest you know thing I tell people in that regard is pay your taxes, do what the government asks of you, because there's nothing worse than building up a fortune and then trying to hide it from the government and then losing it all later. Paying tax is a good thing. Like paying taxes is not fun to do, but it means that you made money. I will take paying a million dollars in taxes over a $4,000 refund check any day of the week. So I, I think a lot of people get been up, you know, all been out of shape about that. But the, the thing that really has been weighing on me the most is you know we were very confident that bitcoin was going to hit a hundred thousand by the end of last year i mean if you would have asked me at the beginning of january last year you know it, what the chances are i mean i, I would have told you 100 percent. so it's it's been very humbling to see bitcoin move in a direction that we didn't really think it, it was going to move in uh to top out at 69k only five thousand dollars higher than the previous all-time high back in may and I think it's left a lot of us in the crypto market, uh, especially as, as influencers or educators, kind of reeling to try to figure out like, okay, what is it doing? Like, what is it doing right now? The traditional historical Bitcoin cycles, uh, we never got a blow off top like we've always gotten before. And, and that's made it really difficult to figure out whether we're at the top of the market or not. And so for me at Bitcoin Crypto, our mission is to empower people to find financial freedom through crypto assets. And I take that true to heart that 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 is the the sole goal of why i do what i do um on this channel so <clears throat> for me when people are now in a position looking to me for leadership and trying to figure out the right way to lead them that's what weighs on me the most the bitcoin price going up or down inside of a vacuum in, in terms of how that actually affects my portfolio or my day-to-day I don't worry about that at all. If I was not a person that made educational content on YouTube for crypto, 
then I would probably just be taking vacations right now. You know, I'd be taking vacations and uh, it's gonna come back, not a big deal. I'd be looking to accumulate crypto, but because my job is to keep the sentiment for crypto up, to educate people on, on where crypto is heading in the long term, and to keep them as plugged into where the markets are today as possible, that's very stressful. I, I definitely weigh out the thoughts and feelings of my audience a lot more than I do about my individual concern when it comes uh, to the Bitcoin prices. So, so for me, I, I think understanding that responsibility and the role that I have, you know, it, it's massive. Some people out there, you know, don't understand it. I always think of, you know, Charles Barkley, who famously said, I'm not a role model, you know, but you are, you know, you, you obviously were a role model while, while you were playing. And I think really taking ownership of, of what our roles are in crypto when we lead people is very important. And you said something important that I could tell from your presence on camera, your crypto portfolio, which is highly, it's big and it's obviously documented, but you're not as stressed about going up and down as you are about keeping your word. And when Bitcoin does the opposite of, and it wasn't just you, BitBoy, it was, right. if I follow 10 experts that I really respect and appreciate, and I feel like they're brilliant, all of them were off. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't you, it was every single person. So the fact that you care more about educating people and that it stresses you out that you're, you, you weren't accurate in some things and no one was, is a testament to you obviously really giving back and helping people, which I love. Now, let me ask you this. Did your confidence waver in crypto, blockchain, decentralization, some of the coins you love when this happened? Obviously, you still have conviction, but what was the mind frame and the mentality of someone at your caliber when things did the opposite of what most people said when all that stuff happened the last couple months? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you you brought up the point that our portfolio is documented. We're, we're one of the only channels out there that actually we disclose all of our crypto holdings. We'll do a video maybe once every three or four months where we go over the portfolio. I usually like to do it when it's at a new all-time high, you know, because, you know, it, it feels better to, to do that than to talk about, um, you know, I lost $15 million, you know, that doesn't feel great. But, um, you know, we've, we've shown multiple times our entire portfolio, everything that we own, you know, we change stuff from, from time to time. Because so we want to be, you know, suit super transparent when it comes to things that you know opinions i may have had changed when it comes to different projects i i think absolutely what you see is you start to see coins that underperformed and you start to wonder will this be a trend is there something about this project whether it's they're not building a, a good enough community whether they're having technical issues they're having on-chain issues uh you know obviously with ethereum the gas fees being really high and how that plays in to the nft markets <clears throat> I, I think that really when it comes to a lot of my predictions we never got to the top of the market that we first saw so of course that's going to have a crescendo effect on every prediction that we made if bitcoin doesn't hit 100k none of the other altcoin predictions were going to come true uh either so we were all kind of you know dependent upon that there were a few coins elrond binance coin solana they kind of exceeded where we thought we were going to go but that was the you know the the vast minority of the you know the top crypto projects i think when it comes to crypto projects and when it comes to a lesson learned i think 2021 the back half of 2021 was an extremely humbling year for me a uh, humbling period of time for me as a content creator to where I'm being more skeptical of a lot of stuff now. You know, I'm being more skeptical. I'm being harder on, you know, different projects and, and trying to figure out where I really think they're going to go. It, it, it's moved me more to a place of looking longer term and seeing the projects that are going to be around in five to 10 years that are really building stuff. So, you know, two, two of those, um, you know, we are an ambassador for crypto.com. So, you know, full disclosure, no connection to FTX. Uh, I was talking about on my live stream earlier, how those are, <clears throat> those are two projects that we definitely see on an upward trajectory because they're building something big and they've got a lot of marketing and advertising and they've got users and they have different uh, financial instruments they're bringing to their exchanges and their staking platforms and things like that. So we're really trying to look more <clears throat> at platforms and how they're being used. I think for uh, layer one projects, grab some water here. When it comes to layer one projects like Cardano, like Ethereum, Solana, Cosmos, Elrond, so many of them, too, too many to name here. I, I think with those, it's got to be more of a wait and see approach 
to be skeptical, like maybe ETH 2.0 does not go off without a hitch and maybe it's never able to scale or get the gas fees correct. We've seen Cardano and Solana both launch and have massive problems. Solana with a lot of shutdowns, um, which you know speaks to a little, you know, not a little, but speaks to centralization and problems on the chain. Cardano built for years and years. We love Cardano, one of our biggest holdings, but it finally got released and they're having on-chain clog issues, which is the whole reason it was supposed to be such a long launch, right? It was taking years, to get everything just right. But I think what you see is any platform out there that's gonna have a rush of users is gonna have some issues. So I think really taking a step back and looking at platforms that are building things and also understanding that a lot of these uh, protocols that you could, you know, you can also, you know, kind of call Ethereum a platform, not, you know, the technical right term there. But when you're looking at those, you're looking farther off and those are more price speculation uh, at this point. So there's definitely a few things that, that, that we've been doing, you know, look like exchanges, they're going to remain busy and maybe not as busy as at the top, but they're going to keep people funneling in there. So they're going to make money whether the market goes up or down. I think trying to find those projects, metaverse, NFTs, you know, they're running kind of counter to the market, um, you know, but just really like, just very simple answer to your question. What, ch like what changes in my mindset, just stepping back and re, you know, reconfiguring, reanalyzing what I think is important about projects and letting that lead. And that's huge because it, it almost in the grand scheme of things in hindsight in two or three years, it's going to make you uh, have higher standards with what you promote yeah. and what you Absolutely. allow into your circle and what you kind of dismiss. Is there any, you talked about FTX and CRO, which I love crypto, um, both those. Is there any more that you were actually like, wow, this is a stronger project than I thought. And then is there any that you're like, man, I'm sadly disappointed in some of these Anything you can mention that you? Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say, I mean, when it comes to being disappointed, uh, the the two that really stand out to me the most are, you know, number one, Cardano. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still believe it's going to be the number two, you know, layer one protocol out there behind Ethereum. I still believe that, but I have been a little, uh, you know, um, disappointed in a lot of the infighting that's been occurring with some of the projects that are built on it. Um, and, you know, I was very disappointed with the congestion issues. And I think it's very important to understand, like, you can have criticism of a project and still support it for sure. We we would you know we would never sell any of our Cardano. We run a Cardano staking pool, you know uh, the Bit pool. So we're long term supporters of it. But I would you know be lying to you if I didn't tell you I was a little disappointed with some of the things that have been taking place. And it didn't even come close to reaching you know some of those price prediction numbers. And and I think the the most disappointing thing about that was it peaked out so early and then never really caught momentum again. And I think that was really disappointing because, you know, when it was at the top, we were still looking at it as a good buy. And of course our audience thought it was a, a good buy. And a lot of people bought above $2, close to $3. Those people are hurting right now. So that, that, that would be the one that I would look and say like, and it kills me to say it because I do love it so much. Um, but the thing, the project that I'm probably the most impressed with is Sandbox. Uh, Sandbox is a project, Metaverse, that we've been involved with since before the token even launched. We had land on Sandbox, you know, six months to a year before the launch of the token, I, probably about a year before the launch of the token. Um, I believe it was in September or November of, of last year. <clears throat> we've been involved with Sandbox forever. And you hear a lot of these hype projects. One right now is Blocktopia. Uh, it, we, we work with them as well. We've done some sponsor content with them. We've done some, some work inside of their metaverse. So like I said, you know, got to disclose on that. And of course, we all own parts of all these in our portfolio, most all the coins I've mentioned. Um, but the thing with it is, Blocktopia has got a lot of potential, but it's still got to be realized. When it comes to Sandbox, you're looking at a metaverse project that came in with a lot of hype, a lot of promise, a lot of big backing, and it's lived up to it. I haven't heard anyone say anything about how, you know, the game or the land is disappointing. And you can see this reflected in the fact that brands are coming to Sandbox and buying land and wanting to be involved. Adidas, uh, I think Puma as well. Um, uh, Snoop Dogg, you know, a brand himself. Uh, then of course you've got other franchises. You've got The Walking Dead. Uh, out of all things, 
I think Smurfs, right? Smurfs has some land in there. Maybe, uh, Atari has land there. Binance has a lot of land there. You guys can go check out the map. You can see our land. Uh, if you check it out, we've got a 12 by 12 spot and some smaller ones. But the gameplay has been phenomenal. Ro Roblox and Minecraft, uh, you know, it's, it's patterned in that format. So I, I think that opens up to show you that like, there's going to be other, like Blocktopia has got a little grittier of a feel to it. Whereas, you know, a sandbox is more of a kind of like, you know, gamified, not gamified Minecraft because it's it, it's gamified as well, but um, like Roblox, just that kind of look and feel to the gameplay. So, you know, the people that like that kind of gameplay, they're really going to enjoy, um, you know, play to earn inside of Sandbox and a lot of the quests and, and being able to, you know, interact with different areas of land through NFTs or, um, you know, different brands. And it's really exciting. And so Sandbox is one to me that honestly, even though the, the market could be heading to a much worse place than it is now, I'm about 50-50. Today I woke up feeling 51%. We're going to have another run here soon, maybe 49%. We're going back down. So, so it's very close. But, Decentral, or, uh, but uh, Sandbox is one that I look at and say, even if the market does go down, this one still could have potential to rise, which is a strong statement. I want to ask you too about your standards and what you look for, because this is a big question that comes up. Uh, and we also want to help people be more self-sufficient. You're looking at a new coin. You're looking at Sandbox. Um, you talked about looking at the team. You talked about what problem it solves. Is there any must like check marks that you look for, like supply, the partnerships? Yes, how big the problem it solves, the founders. Um, if you like the certain technology, what are like maybe your top couple that you always want to check off to make sure yeah. it's a legit project that you like? Because there's so many crap coins these days that just pump and dump and it's losing people a Absolutely. lot of money. So what are the, what are the standards? And look, there are a lot of crap projects out there that people have made a lot of money on the short term. And I'm not talking about just the people that are, you know, dumping from the inside, the venture capital or capitalists or whatever. Some of these projects have made people money over the short term. They're only probably right now, I don't have a list in front of me. There's only about 10 coins that today, I would say are definitely long-term holds. You know, I would say FTT, CRO, Chainlink, um, you know, XRP, Cardano, Bitcoin, Ethereum, after Polygon probably. Um, after that, it gets a little murky. You know, I mean, I've got several projects I could put in those last slots, but it's okay for a person or an individual or an investor to use a project for the short term to make some money, to roll that money into a project you do believe in long term. So I, I do want to be clear about that. But a lot of those projects, they are out there to hurt people. And the, the number one thing we look for, especially like a non-negotiable for my team, we do sponsor content. We do a lot less now than, than we used to. But one thing we learned is that when it comes to sponsored content, it has to be a named team. They have to be doxxed. I understand that people have their own reasons for wanting to stay private and anonymous, but after being on the inside of this industry for a long time now, one thing that people do not understand is the vast majority of these rug pull scams, these, uh, you know, the, the, the pure pump and dumps, they're done by a very small percentage of people. There's about four groups of people that perpetuate almost all of these and they use their anonymity to protect them so you know you just saw it with uh the uh you know one of the co-founders i forgot what his actual role was of wonderland you know he's a serial scammer michael patrin which is a fake name his real name i believe is omar Danani, and it pretty much busted wonderland even though they had some people on the team that were doxxed he wasn't and that led to that project going down um and anything he was involved in was going to be a scam if people knew he was involved in the project they would have stayed away from it i bought it at the top you know lost a lot of money on it but it's important to know the team to know what they're about and the other tricky thing why a lot of people get tricked um look people are looking to use influencers and looking to use youtubers people on twitter whatever the case uh you know looking to use uh, some of the news publications coindesk coin telegraph coin tell lies i call them of course uh, the projects over time they learn the boxes that these and the, the top individuals and the top content creators and media space they learn what they like and they learn how to f create a project that's like i know that it checks all these boxes yeah. so i know he'll think this is a good project and it, we've learned that over time we've been used before we've been lied to before and, and the whole thing revolves around this 
you got to have a lot of confidence, especially if you're putting a lot of money into something that it's real, that it's not going to go away in the short term, that it's not going to pump and dump. But if you're going to pick smaller projects, you also want a, a small allocation of portfolio. You want the vast majority in your portfolio in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then other top top 10 coins. Uh, but I would say the team is the number one, number one thing. Number two, I generally look at the use case and the potential for that. So if you go back to the dot-com bubble, like I, I love talking about this. <laughs> if you go back to the dot-com bubble and you look at, there are two companies specifically that always stand out to me, okay? Pets.com and Webvan, okay? Those were two of the biggest companies during that time that went bust, 100% bankrupt, failed. Well, fast forward 25 years, Pets.com is chewy and Webvan is Instacart. They were ahead of their time. So now, I don't mean literally they're the same companies. I mean, what they do, yeah. they were way too early for what they're doing. So if you've got a coin that's talking about doing something so far in the future, like if you've got a coin that's talking about, <clears throat> you know, driverless trucks, right? Like we're at least five or 10 years away from that, if not 20 to 30. So maybe think about that, you know, maybe think about, you know, uh, you know, if you're getting in something that's really cutting edge, like, okay, is it too cutting edge? Because back then, almost all the ideas from the dot-com bubble were great. They were just too early. So those are the things we look at. Those are the first two things. I mean, obviously you want them to have a good white paper. You, you want the website to not have typos on it. You know, you want everything they put out to show that they put a lot of care and thought in, into what they're, what they're presenting. And then, you know, lastly, I would just mention, look at their backers. I mean, if Andreessen Horowitz or Digital Currency Group um, as much as we hate, you know, those types of, of, of big funds, Three Arrows Capital is, is another one. Um, and I'm, I'm missing a big one. Um, Pantera Capital, Sequoia. When you look at these, uh, uh, Alameda Research, which is uh, Sam Bankman Freed's uh, company, Coinbase Ventures. When you look at these companies being behind crypto projects, you can be fairly certain that they're going to do well at some point. We had covered some before that actually, unfortunately, like, you know, they had good backing. Tim Draper backed a project uh, through Draper Ventures. It was called DMG, I believe. And it went belly up. They had to close. The SEC came after them. So it's not a guarantee, but that's generally a good trend. You can use a website called Masari, M-E-S-S-A-R.io, and you can actually look at the portfolios uh, of a lot of these big companies. That's huge because I'm seeing I'm seeing a similar uh, move and similar standards that we need to follow in the NFT game. Yep. There's a lot of rug pulls in the NFT game where the owners aren't doxxed. And there's some BitBoy where when I researched the founders of some of the, the rug pulls, he had other scams. I'm like, if, if the mm -hmm. owner, if the people that invested in the NFTs would have just done a little bit of research, they would have realized the guy's a scammer. So it's not a shocker. So I think doxed and i think really doing your due diligence and research and not just i think the days of investing in a coin because kim Tar kardashian said to that, that, that that's not yeah. smart but no i mean the, it, uh, ethereum max she she did and now she's in trouble for promoting it we warned people about that project floyd mayweather was promoting it kim kardashian yeah. other, other people they're all being sued now which this will be you know now they're, they're being sued in civil court they're not being sued by the sec yet but the SEC already has had action against Floyd Mayweather, and now he's got a second project that you know he's promoted. He, people are coming after him civilly as well, um, and, and so you do have to be careful, um, you know, uh, about a lot of that stuff. And, and I definitely agree that when it comes to you know NFTs, you got to kind of follow uh, you know the same research patterns. But I really want to highlight something I feel like you were getting at, which is this. You, as an individual investor, someone plugged into this crypto world to graduate to the next level where you're truly, truly going to be able to find that financial freedom and create your own space, you have to create your own vacuum of research. Mm -hmm. You've th That's what works for us, but we have like not unlimited money, but we got a lot of money to throw in bad projects. And if it goes belly up, we're still gonna make money because overall we're investing in a lot of projects. If you are in a very limited budget and you are trying to have a small portfolio to grow into something where you can truly change your life, 
you, you have to do it yourself. You have to grow up. You got to put on your big boy or big girl pants, figure out your own things that you look for and, and create something and you may fail. You may come up with some different criteria and then you find, oh, that wasn't the best thing. You lose some money, but it's all part of the process. Every time you lose money in crypto, whether it's because the market is going down, you did not take profits, whether you got fished or you got hacked, whether you invested just in, in bad projects, whatever the case may be, each one of those, you don't look at it as a failure. You have to look at those as expensive lessons. And those lessons on the smaller level is what keeps you from doing stupid stuff when the money is big. It's tricky because it's, it's counterintuitive sometimes where I've seen a lot of people make money where they're taking profits at all time highs. When it feels like when there's an all time high, you want to put money in because you don't want to miss out. Yeah. And then when things are dipping, it feels like you should sell everything because it's going to go to zero and you're scared when that's when wealthy people actually invest. So it's counterproductive to a lot of the feelings people have, which is why a small percentage really do crush it. Someone asked about, you said you made quite a bit of your wealth in 2018 during the crash. Is similar? Is something similar happening now with your portfolio in terms of, are you looking at coins to invest in? Are you kind of standing still to see what happens the next couple months with all the stuff happening with the SEC. What's kind of your 2018, you built some wealth because the market was crashing. Is similar things happening now or is there a different strategy? I, 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 I wanna be clear on this. I, I did not build a lot of wealth in, in 2018. Um, when people hear my story, you know, they, they seem to assume a couple things. I bought $10,000 worth of Bitcoin when it was at 12 bucks in 2012. They'll you know, think that's how I got rich. No, I sold it all in 2013, what I had left. And that was the lesson I had to learn in 2017. You know, you need to be educated. You need to learn what this is about, not just make decisions based on numbers. Um, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, arbitrary numbers of yep. Bitcoin going up or down. Uh, and, and other people will look and say, oh, you bought all this stuff in the bear market. Yeah, I bought some crypto in, in the bear market for sure. Um, you know, I bought Ethereum at $90. I bought, um, you know, some of these other projects when they were much, you know, Bitcoin at, you know, I sold at seven and bought back in at four. Like I, I did some good stuff, but my biggest thing was I have created my wealth out of this channel. And, and, and the reason, and, and I really think people have got to understand that because some people may hear that comment and they may say, oh, he just made all this money because he did a YouTube channel. Okay, he, here's what I did. In 2018, you could say that I laid the foundation foundation for my wealth because I understood that number one, um, you know, this was the future. And number two, I realized the way to make money in an industry is get involved in the industry. I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a hundred thousand dollars to put into Bitcoin in 2018. In 2017, I rode Bitcoin up and then I rode it all the way back down to not zero, but all the way down to loads where I was in a loss in my portfolio. And we're talking about thousands of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But here's here's what I did. A lot of people probably know this story, and I'm just gonna tell it very quickly. Henry Wells, this is the guy who created Wells Fargo that you see today. He got rich doing one thing. He got rich, not through banking, that you know Wells Fargo has today. He got rich during the gold rush. Everybody came out West to buy gold or to mine gold. 90% of those people did not find gold. Only 10% of those people did. Similar to crypto. In crypto, it's easy to make money over the long term. The majority of people, they come and they go in short-term spurts. They don't stay over the, the long term. Whereas you could say gold mining might have actually been a little more luck, like you're just in the right in, in the right cave. Crypto, it's very clear. It, you, it has a time bias. The longer you're in, the, the better chance you're going to have to do well. But he realized he didn't want to mine for gold. He wanted to sell the shovels, sell the hard hats, sell the mining equipment, sell all of the pickaxes, all the things that people needed to do, the flashlights, in order to mine the gold themselves. And that's kind of the basis. I started this channel because I want to educate people on crypto, want to educate people on the opportunity that I missed on so nobody else misses it. And number two, because I realized this was a way for me to get involved. And over time, I became an expert through doing the channel. I wasn't an expert first. All of the research I put in. In 2018, I, I sold my house. I took, I had about $150,000, whatever it was. I didn't put that money to crypto. I put some, like maybe about $20,000, but I put the vast majority, I lived off that money while I created this channel. I invested way more than just financial resources I didn't have. I invested my entire life, my family, my career, my house, my future. That's what I invested into crypto. 
And over time, as I started bringing revenue through the channel, then yes, that, that is where a lot of the gains came in when I was doing videos where someone would pay me maybe $2,000 in Ethereum when the price of Ethereum was $150. You could do that math now and see that holding that over the long term is what brought out, brought out my wealth. And that's something I always try to tell people. If you want to get more involved in crypto, get more involved. There's way more upside to doing that than to just, you know, throwing money at it and then walking away and not getting invested and, and, and not learning. Yes, I bought crypto at low prices, but you know, I, I think understanding like I didn't invest my money. I ran out of money to invest because I invested my whole life into crypto. And of course, every person out there, you can't do that. You, you can't invest your entire life into crypto, something maybe you're just learning about. But I think there's a very valuable lesson there. Um, and I'd say my wife is very supportive because there were certainly times in those first two and a half years where we were barely hanging on and um, I wasn't you know, I, I wasn't making a lot of money. You know, we, we were barely surviving. I was having to do side hustles. Uh, I almost quit the channel in January of 2020, which was the month before things really blew up for me. But having a supportive wife that, you know, b believed in my dream that, you know, this was, you know, what we were gonna do for the future. I, I think that was huge. So it, it, it's a story of believing in crypto and online entrepreneurship, you know, kind of, you know, melded together um, that really brought me to where I'm at today, but, if I did have the money at that time, I certainly would have been investing it. I had an early business in 2011 through 2014 that did absolutely phenomenal. So I did have the money back in 2012 to put $100,000 into Bitcoin, but I didn't believe in it at that point. So I had to fast forward to then to 2017, beginning of 2018, when I really was hit with the crypto bug and the belief this is going to be around forever that's when I, you know, really went all in with, you know, every single resource that I had. How does it feel now knowing, and I've heard the story and, I, and it inspires me every time because it's so easy. It's so easy for the keyboard warriors and for people on the outside who aren't putting in the work to be like, ah, oh, he's lucky. Oh, uh, he already had money. Oh, he made this, 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 and not understand how much you actually sacrificed. How does it feel now uh, being able to impact millions and being able to inspire, like going to the Hawks games, the Falcons games, getting floor seats getting being yeah. in the press box uh being being able to buy an amazing I don't, I, how much was the car 300 to 300 thousand Three, 375 300 000. exactly how does it feel knowing how much you sacrificed and the people close to you believing in you and now being able to to impact millions and have a great life that you're proud of is it a pretty cool feeling man i mean i can't i can't express it i can't express my gratitude and how thankful i am and i just want to go back like it was my wife. Not everyone has a wife as supportive as I have, or, or as supportive as I have. She is truly incredible. I feel like almost any other woman on earth would have thrown me out and been like, you're an idiot. You need to go get a job. But she just believed in me so much that even when everything was saying otherwise, in my spirit, I felt things were gonna turn around and, and, and she did too. Like she believed in me and that is what really led to my success. So it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling of redemption. Um, when we sold our house, I told her my goal was within two years. <clears throat> well, once we sold our house and we moved, we were in a very tiny rental for uh, you know a, a while. Uh, we had no backyard and we had been used to the house we lived in before that we sold for this. Um, had a big backyard. It was very painful to watch my kids not have a place to play. To, to come downstairs when I was wearing 20 hour days and say like, dad, what's the deal? You know, like you're here, but you're never here. And, and those were heart wrenching moments, but I always assured them this would be temporary. And I told my wife that we would buy a house and, and the goal was to buy it with cash, not to just go get, you know, a, a mortgage and, and buy it with cash and stuff like, or, you know, do it the traditional way. But that was like the goal I had when I created this business was to buy a house with cash. So I never have to put my family through this again. So we never have to worry again what's going to happen because I had left my job and we didn't have money coming in. And that's why we, we went this direction. And um, because my passion, it, it changed to crypto, obviously. And it would have been very easy to, to give up on that. And we went through a lot of sacrifices as a family. I told her two years from where we moved into our rental, which would have been in uh, January of uh, 2019 is, is when we moved in. And about, you know, <laughs> over a year into that, it didn't look like we were gonna make it happen. You know, it looked like, okay, like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like I said, I was doing a lot of side hustles to, to survive. Um, but then when it finally turned around, it went from like, I don't think we're gonna do this to in 
April of 2019 is when, or of uh, 2020 is when things really, you know, kind of started to turn around for us. Um, financially, the, the channel was doubling like every month at that time. And in September of 2020, I was able to walk in and buy a $275,000 house, which it's a big, it's like, you know, 3,000 square feet here in, uh, you know, Metro Atlanta. So I mean, $300,000 would be a shack, you know, in some places in the country, but- I'm in San Diego. House. Right, exactly. So a nice big backyard. And that was the moment of like validation of like, we did it. And I think there's another lesson there that I always try to talk to people about, which is don't be greedy. I had to pull money out. And there's people out there that will tell you, you need to save up every dime that you have to get the most purchasing power to do the most stuff with. I set a goal. And when I got enough, a little bit above enough money to do that, I said, no matter what happens from here, I'm going to pull this money out and I'm going to buy this house because this was the goal. I didn't get greedy with it. And then fortunately, you know, we've been really blessed and, and, and things have continued on, on an upward trajectory. And, you know, that was when, you know, crypto prices really started going uh, parabolic and getting close to saying new all-time highs <clears throat> at that point. And that feeling's great. I love sports. I want to have, I want to own the Falcons one day. That's the whole point of this business. That's why I, 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 you know, became the biggest channel, you know, biggest American channel still, uh, you know, we bought the house, we got nice cars, we do all this stuff. We do this for the people. But in the background, the thing that keeps driving us on is I want to own the Falcons one day. That'll be the next chapter of my life. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that got to go right, not just financially for that to happen. But that's that's the goal and that's what we want to do. And, and it feels amazing. I'm living a life that only a fraction of 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 a percent of people ever get to live. And, and, and I think, you know, I could say hard work because hard work definitely plays into it. I worked 20 hour days for 10 months when nobody was watching my channel. Um, <clears throat> but what I would tell you is that, you know, it's not, you know, th there are people out there that do landscaping that maybe work more hours and, you know, it, the manual labor is much more intense, but hard work, perseverance, picking the right direction and having someone that believes in you, consistency, these are all the things that led to the recipe that got me, uh, you know, to, to where I'm at. And people can do that. People are scared. I, I think my, you know, my risk, uh, my, my level of risk was gigantic. The vast majority of people would not sell their house to start a YouTube channel. Yeah. I believed in it that much. And so my, my risk reward ratio has really played that out. The risk was huge. The reward was huge and, and there's a chance i could have been very successful and not ever gotten to the level i'm at now so i think there is a you know a little bit of a you know maybe favor blessing going on there somewhere so but like i said very thankful for the life that we live i love me and my wife are going to the super bowl next week she's never been i took my boys last year so th these are things that i only dreamed of when i was younger and um you know i'm just so fortunate and i just always use that to remind myself it's all about taking that and giving it back mm. to people. So, you know, that's why we're doing a big push. We're going to be doing a lot of, uh, a lot more charity stuff this year. So we're excited. That's amazing, that. man. And it may, now it makes sense looking from the 50,000 foot view on your story, where the consistency and hunger comes from. Anyone, yeah. any, anyone that's been through those tough times, that's been dead broke, that put it all on the line, that has someone that believes in them. There's, there's, there's no shortage of hunger or, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like your hunger staying with you because you went through those tough times. So well, it's, it's, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I went not, not to cut you off, but like, I remember there were times <clears throat> in, in the darkest part of this where I would have to go drive and I would pull up on the side of the road and I would just sob on the side of the road. Like I, I go to a parking lot and I would just, I would just cry out because I, I, I felt so defeated as a person that I was putting everything I had into this and nobody cared. Nobody was watching. My family was suffering. There, we had no backyard. My kids couldn't play. We had to, like, every purchase my wife made, she had to call, like, hey, uh, is it okay if I, you know, buy the kids, you know, uh, new, you know, church clothes or whatever? And, and every single thing, you know, that, that she did, she would have, have to call me because things were that tight at one point. And so, you know, there's a little phrase I like, which is, you know, right on the other side of every wall, it's breakthrough waiting to happen. And I think that's important. So many people do get to that point where they're up against the wall and they quit and they give up. And there may be a time where you do have to go get a job or you do have to, to, to change what you're doing. You can't give up on that hunger and the drive to succeed in what your original passion 
was. And, you know, that that was really, um, you know, so, something that continued to drive me and that hunger because I was just so tired of living paycheck to paycheck. And when you've got a family and when you look at your kids and you're not yeah. sure, you know, in a month from now, if you're going to be able to afford Christmas presents for them, then that'll hit you between the eyes, you know, and that'll give you that hunger, that insatiable, insatiable hunger to be able to move more, you know, uh, do more um, and achieve more. That's huge. I, 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 I'll, it took me years to figure this out. And this is such a hack for a lot of you. We have a lot of young whippersnappers on here. A lot of young people making six and seven figures already. They're, they're, they're crushing it, wow. but they don't have a family yet. Yeah. And one of the best pieces of advice I got from my mentor, I think it was like 2009 or 10, maybe 11. And he said, the most important decision you'll ever make in life and business is who you choose to spend the rest of your life with. And I'm like, yeah. what, uh, what wife girl? No. And and I realize now that I have a supportive wife as well. It's always believed in me, even when we were dead broke. So the fact that you said that, it's so important to have people around you that hold you to high standards, that build you up, that force you to not just be hungry, but want to live the best life possible. So now when you're at the Super Bowl, you're not like complacent, like, oh, it's the Super Bowl. You're like, this is crazy that I'm at the Super Bowl yeah. because of what I went through. Yeah. I almost think it makes the journey. Do you feel like going through all that tough time? Do you feel like it made you like almost bulletproof mentally and stronger? Well, I'll tell you this, there is no industry out there to tougher, tougher to be at the top at than crypto. And I really believe that. I was warned by other crypto influencers on YouTube as my numbers were going up. I was warned. I said, you don't, they said, you don't want to be the biggest. You don't want to be the face of this. The hate, the, the trolling, um, the comments, people telling me to kill myself like that stuff will come. And I was like, eh, whatever, you know, I, I, I can handle it. Well, I, I was built for this. You know, I, I went through tougher times. I mean, we, we haven't even got into my, my recovery. You know, I've been in drug recovery now since 2007, overdosed, you know, was in a coma, almost died, was under arrest, two years of rehab. Like that built me, that built me up for the next phase in my life where I would go through those dark times where the storms would come. And I get stronger every time. And it doesn't matter how many people out there want to bring me down. Like, you know, the hardest thing for me is probably dealing with the lies. Like people straight up make, they make up lies about me to try to throw me under the bus and say like, oh, he talked about this. And then the price went up and it went down. He must have been pumping and dumping. We've never done that on the history of my channel. Never done that a single time. Never made a video with the goal of the price going up so we could individually make money. I don't even I don't even get to touch my own crypto anymore. My CFO handled it. So, you know, those things when people accuse us of doing that, you know, that is really the hardest part. But I've got a Teflon back and, and I got a lot of arrows that people shoot at that all the time. Uh, and, and the more that they shoot, you know, I always think of Kobe Bryant, you know, my, my, my favorite athlete of all time, you know, so sad what happened, you know, the, the only time, uh, you know, I can think of that I cried over someone who died, you know, like I, I haven't had a lot of death in my family, you know, but great grandparents and, you know, when it was time for them to go and, and things like that. But I shed tears over Kobe because I, I loved his attitude so much. It was very sad that the world was robbed uh, of that going forward. But I think of Kobe when he would go into opposing arenas and he would just get booed and booed and booed and he fed off of that. When I see that kind of stuff coming at me, that fuels me to be better, to go further and uh, you know to, to prove people wrong. And sometimes the hate out there definitely gets to be a lot, but then we go to meetups. We had a meetup in Austin, Texas last week and uh, we had 600 people there, whole giant room full of people. We do it like a Q and A, we do a little talk and then we do pictures and stuff. It's so fun, I love meeting the people. And you just hear story after story about a 19 year old who just bought a house. Yeah. Uh, a guy whose dad just went through a financial crisis. He was just able to go and turn around and, and give him the money. People reaching dreams, giving up debt. Um, you know, I, I like to believe that our channel has probably made more millionaires than possibly any other channel in the history of YouTube. Uh, and I remember a story of a guy that I know, Jake Canfield, who told me he was a chiropractor in 2016, uh, and he made 30 millionaires in his office, you know, um, from people that were coming in. And he would tell them like, this Ethereum ICO is coming. I always thought that was so cool. I was like, could you imagine being responsible for that? And that's a drop in the bucket to what our channel, and, and we're not the sole channel. There's other channels, you know, that, that you know, ha, ha, have made a lot of millionaires. But collectively, 
there's no telling how many millionaires you know we've made in crypto and that is something that i'm probably the most proud of when those people come and talk to me that's what gives me the energy and they, it reminded me like it had been too long since we had done a meetup and, and, and when when i'm not getting those stories and getting to meet people on a one-on-one -on -one basis or you know a, a, group, a husband and wife whatever the case may be then you know i'm not kind of getting that fuel to kind of combat a lot of, of, of the hate out there so like i said there th there's nothing that people can put me through that that's hard that you know is harder than the things that that i've been through and that's why yes it is hard being at the top or you know there's a channel bigger than us now you know in another country but you know we have the biggest social media following by a long shot we've got like almost seven million total followers and um you know it, it's something that's absolutely amazing and i feel a connection with each one of those people and i love when they do well and so if you ask me if i take the trade off shoot the arrows all day i do want to commend you and make you kind of realize that when there was hate and it was from some big names i remember i don't know if you remember this matt we had a conversation where i was confused because i was I, I was watching a lot of your stuff and some stuff some big names one of the big bitcoin enthusiasts that i lo actually lost respect for after this was saying certain things about you and after researching what he said i'm like actually when you actually think about what he said and you actually watch your channel none of it's accurate you yeah. actually don't you you promote a lot of coins and you're like i actually don't have this coin i'm probably going to get it i love it i'm not sure we don't hold this but i like the team you do that all the time and he was saying you only promoted coins you have and then you dump them so I, I think sharp people probably got more respect for you and you probably got more fans from that uh hate because it wasn't accurate and i, I everyone that has hated on you that shared certain reasons why they actually haven't absorbed your content, which is the sad part. Well, I, I, I got into things. a, yeah. I got into a big debate, you know, with a guy on YouTube, uh, you know, a, a couple months ago. I'm not gonna, you know, people probably know what I'm talking about if yeah. they saw it. And you know, the guy lied on the live stream. Yep. You know, Seems. said that he had watched my content, he had watched all of these videos that he was bringing up, and he very clearly had not, because one of the things he brought up was this you know, video where we talked about a coin going to a certain price on the thumbnail. And I was like, I can't even remember what was in that video, but I don't think that's what we actually talked about. I mean, you guys know, you know, YouTube is about clickbait marketing, things like that. The whole video was actually about why I, another person said it was gonna go to that price. And I personally believed and warned my audience, it's not going to that price. So it was very clear that it was a straight up lie to try to cover, you know, the lack of research. I, I think a lot of times people, judge me by my face on a thumbnail and think I'm some kind of like unlayered idiot because I make a crazy face for a thumbnail and then they get me on the channel or they get me on a debate and they realize they've bitten off more than they can chew because I've been in this space for a long time and I've seen about everything that you can see and I, I would almost disagree I think you said that you know sharp people I probably earned their respect it's real people it's authentic people. We're we're the people's channel. We're we're the people's channel, and these are the people we meet at meetups. They're regular, everyday people. We had somebody that drove from Las Cruces, New Mexico, to Austin, Texas, with their whole family, brought their kids. I was able to like show their kids like you know some some artwork that my six year old had done. The Peak of Snowman. Some people may have seen it on Twitter, but the real people. If you watch my channel, and you listen every day and you get to know who I am, because we're different than Hollywood celebrities. You don't know them, you know them in a role. When you watch the live stream every day, you know who I am. And it's very obvious to, to most real people that I'm authentic, that I'm transparent. I'm actually an oversharer. I say too much about the truth. And, um, you know, it, it's very obvious. There's a group of people that don't like me. And, you know, they, let me tell you a quick story. Here's a, a quick story is that there was a very large crypto Twitter influencer. I learned a very valuable lesson here. We were approaching his numbers on, on Twitter and I'm very competitive and it was already a guy that has said stuff about me. I didn't really like him. And I said something, I said his name on my YouTube channel one day. I said, this guy, I'm so glad we're about to pass this guy because this guy has been nothing but ugly. You know, he, who knows what I said about it. I usually don't talk bad about people, but when people talk bad about me first, you know, I definitely don't mind going there. Um, but I watched something so interesting after I did that. He was getting an average of 
800 new followers per day on Twitter. For six weeks, the day after I mentioned him, it jumped to 3,500 a day. Just the power of me bringing him up and giving some kind of credence to him, I helped him out tremendously. And that's why you see a lot of these accounts out there, they've turned into hate BitBoy uh, content because the people that are miserable, the, the people that for whatever reason don't like my content, they want me to fail. And they collectively, me and TJ, my business partner talking about this earlier, is like the haters, they do a much better job of being uniformed in response than the good people, you know? Like if there's something that these people don't like, they're, they're like, they're really like sheep. You know, one of the things about sheep, why people call sheep sheep or why people call people sheep or sheeple is because, you know, sheep are very dumb animals. They will get together in a herd. And if one of them has a sickness or a parasite on their head, they will scratch it on the other sheep and they'll scratch that head. And that parasite will transfer from one sheep to the next. And before you know it, that entire herd is infected with the parasite because they're using other people to dump, you know, to dump their parasite on or, or other animals. That's what we see on Twitter. All of these people, it's a big circle of people that want people to be miserable. And what I found about most of them is they're about 17 years old. Most of these people out there that create these accounts, that are pure hate troll accounts. They're very young. And I think that's a big problem on Twitter. Not that young people have accounts. It's a big problem on Twitter where the core of a lot of fights, why I try, I try to never get into it with people on Twitter. Um, I've been a little more feisty, I guess, the last couple of weeks. But the thing is, is that when these people are arguing, if you were in a room as a 39 year old man, I'm not going to argue with a 15 year old. I'm going to understand they have a much different view of life. And if they say something, I'm going to be like, Oh yeah, he's 15, you know, or, you know, th and they do the same thing to me. They say, oh, he's 39, he's old, he's cringe. You know, he, he doesn't know what he's talking. He doesn't know what's cool these days. And, and so I think a lot of sources of conflicts on social media comes down to, to people having vastly different ages. And you feel like, you know, you're talking to an equal. You know, it, one thing just real quick is very interesting about YouTube is I'm always surprised at the height of another YouTuber that I've watched. The reason for that now, I'm 5'10". I'm talking to the average man. Okay, that's, that's a big joke on the channel. But, uh, you know, the reason for that is when we watch people, we tend to assume they're like us if we don't, if we can't see them in context. So there's a guy, Joe Paris, uh, he comes on my, around the blockchain shows sometimes. He's like six, eight, he's, he's so tall, you know, but on YouTube, I'm like, he looks just like a regular person of regular height, but he's a really big guy. And, and I think that's how it is on Twitter in a different way. We feel like we're talking to someone with the same maturity, the same age, the same logic, maybe the same political viewpoints. But in reality, we're arguing with someone most of the time that's totally different. And that's really where the argument comes from. Huge. Thank you for sharing that as well, because it's, it's good. It's a good perspective to have for people to understand. For me, I like to say you'll never really meet a successful hater. When, when someone hates, something is, is, is bugging them or something is wrong with their reflection. It's not really anything to do with you. It could be jealousy or whatever, but it's good to understand that. And when you know yourself, when you're confident in who you are, when you know your content and you have good intentions, it doesn't bug you as much. It's just kind of fun yeah. to go back at them, which well, I like you, that you, you're in that spot now. You know your own motivations. Like I know regardless of what people put out there, that my motivations are very pure. Like I'm a business, we like to make money, but my motivations are very pure for what I do. And I feel it when people lose money, like we were talking about earlier, like that grieves my soul. I want everybody to do well. Out of thousands of people that we meet at Meetup, uh, that we've seen at Meetups or conferences, I'll go to a conference, it's a crypto conference, NFT conference. I make it to the main floor, I don't move. People just surround me for hours. I'll stay in the same spot for four hours talking to people. I will stay there until I talk to every single person that wants to come talk or take a picture or whatever, because I value the community. Never one time has someone said something negative. The most negative thing someone ever said to me. So we're talking about crypto conferences, wide variety of people. So many of these haters are there. You know, a lot of these trolls are there at those conferences. Never came up to me. The most negative thing anyone ever said to me was a guy said, I used to watch your content every day, but it's too long. You do these live streams are too long. Like I watch this guy that's like 10 minute videos. You, you should do more of that. <laughs> it's funny, he was like at this meetup and wanted to take a picture of me. He's like, I don't even watch your content anymore. That's the closest to a mean comment I've ever gotten in real life. So I think that says a lot. 
for sure. So I, I don't know how much time, I, I, I could keep going. I wanna end with a couple questions I wanna hit on because I think they really will help people. One, in terms of protecting, and you talked about in your latest video, protecting and preserving crypto for the masses. You asked the audience, people had some great answers. Current, the current market, the current reality, um, people have hard earned money in crypto. They're confused. There's 300 opinions. Uh, yelling, what do you call her? Yeller, you call her something funny. Yeller. Oh, oh, Janet, no telling, yelling, old, old teller, yeller. Old teller, Janet yeller. Telling, yelling, you know? Yeah, you don't know what's happening. What What is right now you feel like the, the, the best move? Obviously, it's not financial advice. You can't be perfect, but right. if someone holds a good amount of crypto, it, are, are they waiting to see what happens in the next couple of weeks? Should they take some profits if they have any? What's kind of the game plan buy sell moving forward? At least the best of your knowledge yeah. based on your research. So I'm gonna bring it full circle here. I'm gonna go right back to, to where we started this conversation with what I lay up, you know, lay in bed thinking about at night. And it's my audience and how they can best be served in a time that's very confusing. And one of the lessons that I, I talked about that I learned over 2021 was take more profits. It never hurts to take more profits. So as the price of Bitcoin has been heading back in an upward direction, we've been taking profits. Now not, you know, I would say probably, you know, a, a quarter of a percent of our portfolio. So it is not a huge amount that we moved over, but some, let's just make sure as we're going up, we remember the lesson of November, 2021, which is, we're not guaranteed $100,000. We're not guaranteed to have a blow off top. We're not guaranteed that. Still, I think it's about 50-50. We might get one beginning of 2024 or later this year, possibly. A lot of people think that. Like I said, I'm very on the fence. So since I'm on the fence, now over the summer, I wasn't on the fence. Over the summer, I was very, hold on to everything, you know, keep buying, keep buying, accumulate. And we did get that, you know, that, that next leg. I'm not confident in that right now. I'm just like the people watching the channel or in crypto, I'm monitoring the price of Bitcoin right now and trying to figure out to the best of my ability, what direction it's going in. When it's going up, we had a conversation the other day, we had to take out some money for, what was it we had to take out some money for? I can't remember exactly what it was. I think we had to take out like, uh, you know, maybe maybe 200K for some, maybe it was a building renovation, whatever it was, we had to pull out some money. And my CFO came up to me and said, you know, the price of Bitcoin right now, it's at like, it was the day of the Fed meeting. He said, it's 38.5 right now. It's better than 33. And I said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let, let's do it now. No guarantee. Of course it dropped. It's back up around those numbers right now. It's on this recording, but no guarantee that's going to continue. A number, here are two numbers for people to watch out. If the price of Bitcoin goes below 33K, a lot of people are saying 34K now because of the new trend, but I, I just go back to this. If it drops below 33K, we're probably going to see a lot more downward action. If it goes below $28,500, the low from the summer, that's a sign we're probably in a long-term bear trend. Keep money on the side. It can drop down to $20,000. Look, the price of Bitcoin could drop down to $10,000. I don't think it's going to. I don't think it's going below, even on a wick, eighteen dollars to $20,000. But you gotta remember, it is possible, not likely, but possible, okay? Wherever Bitcoin, people think Bitcoin can't go, it tends to go there. So I think 20, 20 to 27, um, we specifically said on the channel, like 24 to 27 would definitely be a place where we would be looking to move a lot of our stable coins back into crypto. So that's the one number, 33K, monitor that. As long as we stay above 33K, we are still bullish. And, and there is, as of right now, even on the weekly chart, if you're ignoring wedges and you're just looking at lower lows and higher highs, we are still on an uptrend until we make those lower lows. Um, so the other number to watch for is $46,000. A lot of people have pegged this as the pivot point. If we get to 46K and then come back down, then we're probably not making all time highs. And I don't mean like, you know, it gets up there and bounces back. I mean, if it gets a clear rejection and we head back in to the 30s, people are looking at 46, 40K or a 46K as a good place to take profits. And that's what we're going to encourage our audience to do. Certainly hope that the market will continue up after that. But if we get back up into the 40s, you know, don't panic, don't panic sell, don't sell the majority of your crypto, but take some profits. And then 
in terms of lifestyle and consistency, your daily routine, um, I, I want to kind of end on that because there's a lot of people that, that want to do what you do, that want to inspire. And they're like, how does he get so much done? How does he have time for family and get content and do videos and manage his team and go to the Hawks games? Um, so can you maybe share a little bit about your routine and your mentality on how you kind of manage everything throughout the week? Just give someone some people some structure. Yeah, I prioritize my sports. I've only been to two Hawks games. We give the rest to our employees. Um, I'd love to go to all of them, but you know, regular season NBA games. I went to the Knicks game, went to the Lakers game. Um, I know that may sound kind of silly, but like there's a lot of events I'd love to go to that I just don't have don't have time for. Um, obviously, I'm gonna go to every Falcons game, as sad as that is, and as much as you know, they lose. But um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I'm the most proud of, and I think people would be the most surprised to see, people think I'm a workaholic, and they might assume that I don't spend time with my family. I leave after around the blockchain every single day. I have an entirely different life after six o'clock. I coach, I'm an assistant coach of my 10 uh, year old son's travel baseball team. So I'm doing that a lot of nights per week. And on the weekends as the spring comes, me doing that. I also, um, you know, go to all my other son's games. He does all stars in the summer. You know, I have a whole other sports life, family sports life outside uh, of crypto because the thing is, is there were times when things were very hard, like we've discussed over and over and over again. And I promised my family it would be temporary. I promised them that no matter what happened in the future, they would never get the 20 hour per day worker for me again. That was it. I did it temporary to get us to a certain place. And so I balanced that family life. I balance, you know, we've made agreement. Like I went, you know, one of the coolest things I did is played in the World Series of Poker main event. I made it all the way to day five and I was on the featured table. At one time I was the chip leader. It was so awesome. Like, I love that. Can't wait to play again in the summer. But ended up being gone for 10 days, you know? And like, that was hard on my family. My wife was there for the first weekend and see my kids for 10 days. And, you know, we had to sit down as a family and say like, okay, what is fair for us as, you know, as a family? We agreed six days per month is what I'm gonna travel at maximum. Not every month have to, six days per month is what I'm gonna travel. And that helps guide me on decisions. Like, do I, I I'm speaking at a conference, do I fly in that morning? Or maybe do I, you know, can I go the night before? It depends on how many days I'm using, um, you know, and, and what's easier. So, you know, we have these kind of like reconfigurations as a family a lot and, and talk about that because I never, you know, <clears throat> I did this for my family. You know, I didn't do this for me or for fame or for riches. I didn't do it for any of that. I did it for my family and it will always be about my family. I, I really detest this. Now, I like Rand for Crypto Banner, but I really detest this life-changing money thing you know i i don't like that people talk about that i believe in a marriage of commitment you know i know people go through different stuff but what I, i'd say is like no no i'm more committed than ever to my family and i think that's that's really important for people to have that balance and to understand like m I, I don't think money changes people it makes you more of what you already are and so you know it's made me a better dad and a better husband but there are times you have to recalibrate as far as how I do what I do, I mean, we have a big team. We have 55 employees right now. We just moved to a 40,000 square foot studio. Started out just me. Two years ago, I hired my sister. We called her the assistant. She's like 21. Hired her to do, you know, as my first editor. Uh, and, and we've just slowly built the team. I brought out, you know, TJ. A lot of people know him from the live streams. That's my business partner. You know, we met on Instagram through this engagement wow. group. We were liking each other's <laughs> pictures. Found out that we were both from the Atlanta area, even though he lived in California. We grew up in the same city. So now he moved back here and, you know, he, he's my business partner and, um, you know, having a really great team and understanding you have a decision, you can either scale or not scale. A lot of people, you know, I tend to call them the lazy millionaires club. There are a lot of people in crypto that made like a lot of money. And now they're just like low on motivation because, you know, why, why do I keep doing this? I've got enough to retire. Like almost all of the top crypto YouTubers have enough money to retire, you know, especially the ones that have been in since 2017, 18 and beyond. Um, you know, they're doing very well financially for sure. I mean, they believed in a crypto asset when it was at its bottom or the, the crypto market, but a lot of them, like they don't want to really do interviews. They don't want to go on other shows. They just want to make their little like cookie cutter content. And that's okay for them. Those people have decided they don't want to scale. If you want to scale and you want to continue, number one, you have to figure out a higher goal. You can't just be doing it for nothing. Like, you know, then when's your quit point? Like 
you got to have a goal. That's why we set this goal of owning the Falcons. Or, you know, if you got to own a baseball team or, you know, get a stadium, whatever it is, like that's, you know, kind of the back half of my life or the back quarter of my life. I, I hope I'm doing something in that regard. But you, you have to have, you know, bigger goals and you have to have the right team around you. You have to build that and you go through growing pains. The number one reason I found that YouTubers don't scale is that, now in crypto, I can't speak for every industry. I assume it's probably very similar though, is because they get to a point where they decide to outsource and start pulling team members in to do different things. And they find they spend more time trying to teach and train those people than it would take for them to do it themselves. And they quit and they say, did not work. Not gonna work for me, it was too much handholding over time, you, you curate better methods of teaching and training, and then eventually you get people under you that train under uh, other people. But that's kind of the pivot point, the hinge point between people that scale and people that don't scale, you know, is it's hard to train people. And we've been very fortunate to build like the greatest team ever. We have Hit Network, if people want to check that out on YouTube, the behind the scenes of what we do here. Uh, we just have phenomenal people thankful every day. That's amazing. I want to know what hand you lost on in the World Series pocket aces I, I i had pocket aces now i had some people would call it a, a questionable call where i called off about a quarter of my stack or a third of my stack with you know uh two medium pairs i ended up calling a boat but it was definitely within that guy's range to totally bluff i'd already decided before he put his stack out there i was definitely calling because such a great chance he was going to bluff so i lost all my stack on that so i was down to you know i, I don't know what it was maybe uh, 15 big blinds a guy bets big then a guy goes over him and then the guy next to me calls and i got pocket aces so of course i go all in for a little bit more the guy who bet big originally folds one guy calls he has pocket jacks and then the guy next to me, the same guy who was playing crazy, he called with two, three offsuit, you know? And technically his odds weren't that bad because three handed, you know, whatever, but it's not a strong hand. And uh, sure enough, man, Jack came right on the turn oh and uh, busted me out. He only had he only had me buy a few chips too. So, but you know what? At least I went out of the World Series of Poker, like playing the, you know, on a hand that nobody yep. could, you know, disagree with the way I played it. So really excited, uh, uh, the Friday of the Super Bowl, uh, going out to uh, the bike casino. I'm gonna be playing on TV, li live as a bike. Uh, I'm gonna be my first little, uh, you know, TV poker playing experience. So excited about that. It's funny. My wife used to play on live with the bike. She uh, she loves poker as well. And oh, I wow. knew you. I knew you'd remember the exact hand. That's the yeah, funny part. It's like yeah. ingrained in your mind, isn't it? Uh, oh, absolutely, <laughs> a absolutely, hundred percent. I appreciate it. And, and, and it's on. And it's recorded. I mean, people can go. You know, Bitboy bust out of the tournament. You can or bust out of WSOB and probably look up the hand. Um, oh, that's that's interesting. I want people to kind of check that out. I wanted to get into NFTs, but we'll save that for a later date. Bolt, you you like you like NFTs. You posted uh, yesterday about your top six. Yeah. Um, I we had our coalition crew like hound your comments. They I saw a bunch of them, so I apologize for that. But okay. um, are you pretty bullish on NFTs? You've been into them the yeah. last couple of months. We so we've built a network here called Hit Network. We have a show called NFT Update that's underneath our umbrella. Um, DZ and Justin Williams host that incredible channel, and uh, you know very plugged into the NFT space. Yeah, we're very bullish on NFTs. I, I, I'm more bullish on NFTs for the long term. Is different kinds of digital ownership, like deeds or insurance or records. I think that's going to be like, like the future. Um, where we're really going to see the use case of NFTs come into play. Right now, we're still in this kind of collectibles art uh, place, which is which is pretty fun. But I think you know, pick and winter. We have our own, you know, our, our own project. Obviously, Pluto Alliance. You know, people know that we, we launched it on the channel. Um, but you know, we, I have board apes, mutant apes. Uh, well, I have one board ape, two mutant apes, a crypto punk. So yeah, we're holding those. I mean, at this point, like I've really bought into the idea. They're a flex. You know? But, but it's amazing because it, it's a flex, but we're also still very early and there's real yeah. value and real money involved and, and, and a lot of utility. So I appreciate you, man. I, I want to thank you just from a personal level. People are going crazy in the chat. They love you. They said, F the haters. We got your back. Like we got, we, you. you got a strong squad. Um, but really one of the reasons I wanted to have you is you have been big on family and, and I have two kids now, uh, two years, three months, and then a nine month old daughter. So I definitely understand like, doing it for the family and the kids and putting the family first yeah. so not just being like a world-class creator and a crypto just a crypto influencer and someone that's really 
changing the game and impacting people. But I like that you're 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 a world class dad and a world class husband. Thank you. That's the stuff that gets me excited because all the money, all the fame, all the hype, all the excitement, the 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 the, the views and the subscribers. That doesn't necessarily hold a candle to the family. Yeah, a a absolutely. I said that's why I did all this, and I think that. You know, we, we call ourselves a family channel. You know, we don't cuss on the channel. You know, we try to keep it as clean. We may make some funny innuendos, and that's what she said jokes and, and similar <laughs> stuff. But, you know, I, because I want my kids to be able to watch my content and not be like, what did dad say? Or, you know, what, what was he talking about? Like, I want to be able to have a place where my kids are, are, are proud of me and my family is proud of me. And my mom watches the channel, you know, grandparents watch the channel. Everybody, you know, that's involved in my family at different times, they watch the channel and I want to be proud uh, of what I put out. And, and I think that, like I said, losing that balance between family and work is probably the thing that destroys you know the most marriages out there yeah. and um you know i definitely look at marriage as a commitment and something that you have to work on all the time just because i've got a great marriage now doesn't mean if you know i started you know doing whatever i wanted ignore my wife and not listening that it would stay a good marriage you know you have to keep working at it and uh you know for those of you that aren't married like don't lower your standards find somebody out there that you're definitely you know gonna, gonna want to treat like that because uh marriage is you know i know divorce rates high and stuff but you know to, to me it's the biggest commitment you can make in your life and um that's definitely what, what i like to stick to and I, I think keeping that balance is so important and for my kids like you know uh, before i did this full time my last job you know I, I worked off and on for about 10 years in different roles i eventually became the executive director of a drug recovery center for teenage boys uh, here in Georgia. And I, I did that for a long time. I, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't have my degree in counseling, but I would, you know, get, talk to them and help them out at, you know, for different things. Cause I came from that world, you know, being a kid that was always in trouble and, and stuff like that. But it really gave me a window into how damaging, you know, upbringing can be to kids, yeah. you know, sure. how damaging, you know, a lot of people think that, and, and this is so powerful. A lot of people think the opposite of, you know, love is hate. There's a reason they say there's a thin line between love and hate because you got to be passionate for one or the other. The biggest thing that destroys kids more than physical abuse, actually, believe it or not, more than sexual abuse, the thing that destroys kids more than anything is when their parents are negligent and don't care about them. You know, when their parents are too, too busy for them, especially if they're too busy at a job or too busy at church. If they're too busy at church, then you know you bet your bottom dollar. Then they're not going to want to have anything to do with that, you know, because they're going to see their parents chose that uh, over them. And so I, I, I've taken a lot of that, you know, into consideration as I've been a dad, and not ever wanting my kids to feel like I wasn't there for them, that I didn't care for them. You know, we don't miss ball games. I mean, occasionally I may miss one for you know whatever reason, but we're there at everything, and we want to be our kids biggest cheerleaders and their biggest fans for uh, their whole lives and and support them. And that's what leads to kids that have healthy lives. We need more people like you, man, leading the way by example, not talking in words, but leading by example. So final words for anyone that watches this, that just is out there just wanting to make a difference, wanting to build an amazing family life, wanting to create financial freedom, any kind of final words. I've watched a lot of your videos, you're inspirational, but this you're on a different level today with the inspiration, man. So I wanna let you keep going. Any final words that you can leave someone with? If you're talking to, let's say you're in a stadium, BitBoy, and you're talking to 50,000 people that just wanna better their life, what's kind of the final message for them? Yeah, well, I think first, like, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, but I think one reason why this has been such a great interview, you've asked such great questions. You know, th this is stuff I really like getting into the nitty gritty about, you know, um, about much more than just Bitcoin go up, Bitcoin go down, you know, and, and I appreciate, you know, the, you know, ability I've had on this show to be able to, to share some of those things I don't always get to share. But what I would say is to the message to people that would be listening, the world is changing. The world is is changing. We are moving to a new economy. It is not out of the realm of possibility that 50% of the world economy may be involved with video games in 30 to 50 years from now, maybe sooner. We're going to see almost all jobs able to be replaced by robots and AI at some point, whether it's algorithms or physical, you know, physical robots, whatever it is, the world is changing. The only jobs out there that are probably safe for the long term are things that definitely involve, you know, service to people, you know, uh, counselors and, th and things like that. you got to figure out where you're going to be in this new world. It, it doesn't have to be in crypto. It can be in NFTs. I think metaverse itself is going to be bigger than crypto as an area, as a niche, as an industry. 
even though it's based on blockchain and decentralized crypto, I think metaverse is more of the story. It's going to be just akin to gaming. You're going to talk metaverse and games in the same breath. I mean, esports e make more money than every professional sports league combined. <laughs> so the thing is, learn as much as you can. My biggest regret getting involved in Bitcoin was in the early days, putting money into something that I didn't care to learn. I didn't take the time to learn. Figure out where you think you may be. Find out what you're passionate about. Find out, you know, find something that aligns with that and then go deep in it and make a commitment, a lifelong commitment that that's what you're going to pursue. You may get sidetracked. You may have to go, you know, the famous joke, you know, you may have to go work at McDonald's when the price of Bitcoin is down. Do what you have to do to survive, but also always keep that long-term vision and passion uh, in perspective. From everybody watching, man, I appreciate you. You can find, I don't really need to give his name, guys, in terms of where to find him. He's all over um, Twitter, IG, YouTube, BitBoy underscore crypto on IG, uh, Twitter, same thing. And I believe BitBoy crypto on YouTube, you type it in and there's just countless videos nonstop. You do videos. I feel like I was talking to Horace earlier, one of my uh, guys, and I feel like you're the most up-to-date real time in terms of crypto influencer on the planet. Like real time, Thank not you. talking about, not creating a video about what happened three months ago, but like yeah. right now. So we appreciate that. Thank you again. Let me know if there's anything I can do to support what you do and anyone else as well. And uh, we appreciate you, man. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, we'd love to be on, uh, you know, another time in the future. Appreciate you. Thank you. Have an amazing rest of your day. Have fun at the Super Bowl. Who do you got? Oh, I'm taking the Rams. Uh, Matt Stafford, Georgia Bulldog. You know, I'm a big Georgia fan. Uh, Sonny Michelle plays running back for them also, Georgia Bulldog. So uh, pulling for them, it'd be so fun to see uh, Matt Stafford after, you know, a career no playoff wins to win the Super Bowl. I love it, man. Well, thank you. Have an amazing time. We'll be thinking about you. I appreciate you. Have a great day, man. Okay. Thanks. All right, Thanks, bye. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed that interview with BitBoy Crypto, you're going to absolutely be mind blown at this interview with Michael Saylor. Trust me, you'll be glad you did and you'll thank me later. If you want 8 billion people to do business with each other and 100 million companies at the speed of light with no friction, you're gonna have to do it with digital energy.